Hey, everybody. Today on my podcast is Leah Hudson Binkard. She is operations manager at Banner Music. Uh, She's a Troy University alum, and she began her career, you know, nice place to start your you're working at Nashville Songwriters Association, uh, NSAI, where she served in so many roles um, from advocacy and membership. And then she became the director of membership and songwriter events. So part of what she does at Banner is she oversees the day-to-day functions of the company, including projects in artist management, music publishing, and label services. And if that weren't enough, she also serves as music market co-chair for Solid and is on the Women's Music Business Association, the WNBA, not the basketball, (laughs) philanthropy committee. And so she's doing so many great things. She's been a longtime friend of mine. Uh, We met at Troy University, and she's just doing great things in her music career. Get ready for a wonderful interview. We could have talked. In fact, we're going to have to have a part two because we could have talked for a couple more hours. Lots more things to go over and to discuss with Leah. But uh, sit back and get ready for a great chat. Hey everyone, it's me, Jilla Webb, your host of Walking With Porpoise, here with my guests to help you develop your foundation of purpose and fine tune the four pillars of success, practice, performance, presence, and peace. Let's get started. Well, today I am here with Leah Binkard, and Leah, thank you so much for joining us today. Yay, thank you for having me, Jilla. This is going to be so fun and um, before we even technically got started, we almost just spent like an hour just chit chatting and chatting, and I could do that with you anytime. <laughs> well, same, same here. And I, I just, you know, I will. I the listeners don't know, but we went to school together, yeah, which we is did. odd because I'm, <laughs> you know, so much older than you. But that's on me. I waited a long time, but we were in classes together, and that's how I first met you. And I'm just so thrilled at everything you're doing and watching your career and you just blossom in Nashville. It's really cool. So I'm really happy to have you and talk to you on the podcast today. That is so sweet of you to say. And honestly, likewise, I was thinking, you know, getting ready for this conversation, I was thinking back to those classes and how <clears throat> different of people we both were, you know, at right. that time. And how eager we were. And I'm sure that's where a lot of your students are right now. Um, But what's interesting is neither one of us was really, I mean, you had grown up with music and, you know, had been involved with the industry prior to that. But at that moment in time, it was not really about music or entertainment. It was like, we love, we know we love people and culture. And that's what brought us into that class or those classes that we took. Um, So I think it's interesting that both of us aligned in such a way that brought us forward basically on a really similar um wheel of interest I guess right right (laughs) well you know music is and uh, you know I teach this in my survey of pop class but it's there's so much culture that's reflected and and promoted through music and by music in our society and in our world so um, I think you have to be, you know, you have to look at societies and you have to have an interest in culture if you're going to write about things and you're going to be in music, you know? So that's kind of a cool thing about music. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's how I ended up wanting to be more involved, really. Yeah. <clears throat> it was like, it was like, well, you remember in the humanities, it's sort of, you have to narrow your focus. Right. Um, and I had this really incredible professor. I don't know if you ever got to uh, learn from her because she actually was an adjunct from Dothan. Mm-hmm. Um, her name is Dr. Janine Brooks, and she taught some really incredible sociology classes. But um, one of them was called Social Change. Mm. And during that, um, we did like a special study, basically, of... Um, songs that changed American culture starting in like 1963. So wow, starting great, yeah. In, yeah. And then up to present day, which was at the time was, you know, into the 2010s, early 2010. Um, 
and that was that totally moved me and so that actually that course sort of lit this fire about like wait because learning about you know that there were people involved with getting those songs from the songwriter to the marketplace and I was like okay there that means (laughs) there's more to this and that actually kind of lit a fire in me to even explore the music industry program because prior to that I just thought oh you know it's it's singers and microphones and right audio guys and that's it right but there's so Um, much more so much more to it so I actually have that course I you know in part to thank to thank for that that sort of change in my academic life at least well and then from there you did go into the music industry side of things at Troy yeah so you got more of a, a a look at the industry there but from there you had your internship was with NSAI correct and is that where you that from there you got hired there is what I'm thinking yes yeah that's what happened so um I I was at a place in college and I'm I'm sidebarring here because if your listeners are anything like me I was having a hard time with all the decision making that comes at you in college right um and in that pathway and and basically I had this huge decision in front of me where I wasn't required by the coursework to um you know have an internship oh um, but I had spoken to a couple of graduates and things like that, people that I trusted or that, you know, my professors trusted and mentors trusted. And they basically all were like, you need an internship um, if you want to have a viable career. Right. And I, it's hard to say, you know, what if I didn't, what if I, but I know at least for me, that internship did launch my career a hundred percent. So I had been there. I basically moved to Nashville signed a year lease with no real plan other than that internship. Oh, um, I wow. Just knew, yeah, I just knew like, okay, well, this is the thing. So I went fully in. Burn the boats. Um, <laughs> which my parents didn't love that. At the oh, time. I bet not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, it was the only course I was technically taking at the time. It was like I was going to do that in the fall and then come back in December and graduate. So I was – um about two weeks into it and some things shifted internally. And part of that is just, you know, being prepared, but also being at the right place at the right time and having a good enough, uh, worldview, I would say like, um, I carried myself at least in a way that they, what I'm trying to say is I was faking it till I, you know, fake it till you make it. Right. (laughs) Um, so (laughs) I was just like, they're maybe two or two or three weeks and then they they asked me to come in full time and at that point um my that's what my internship became was you know five days a week all day like a normal desk job but what was cool was that you know it was paid internship which I was not planning on it being that you know I had had not prepared for it to be that set up but it just kind of happened pretty quickly and then um I stayed around and basically moved my way up through the ranks. And so where did you start? What were your responsibilities? And then what did you move up to? Oh, God, everything (laughs) under the sun. So when it started, it was a lot of um, I would say the first year was a lot of admin and like reception duties, like things you would think of as entry level. So, um, you know, office work, but they they NSAI is a not-for-profit organization, which also made it very easy to really lean into the mission mm-hmm. and stick around. Um, and also, like the the very quick movement upward for me made it easy to stick around. But um, and of course, all the amazing songwriters I got to deal with, like that was an experience I'll never forget. But basically, that it started as a lot of boring reception type uh data entry scanning documents you know stuff like that yeah um and then you know what i'm actually let me reflect on this timeline so that was actually just the first couple of months and then they moved me up again and at that point i was executive assistant wow Um, so i did that for about a year maybe maybe longer than a year um and so when that shift happened, I was thrown into the legislative world. So 
I was going to D.C. I was planning congressional meetings. Um, you know, I, I have to be careful not to say that I was like strategizing, but I was definitely in the conversations around, um, you know, the important discussions and the tact that goes into um, passing a law, mm-hmm. passing a bill into law. So and that so was. We're talking about the Music Modernization Act that you were working yes. on. Right. Yes, that was that was the exact timeline. So I started doing that in January of 2018, and then we passed the bill in October 2018. So what was it so. like to go to to DC and actually be there and be a part of that? That's really cool. It was overwhelming for me at that age, um, as especially as a young woman and in music. And trying to like find my footing because I never really saw myself as like a bureaucratic type of person. Um, I'm still really not, but I think going up there, kind of like you were talking about building something from the ground up, it also, in that same sense, it felt very busy. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it really didn't ever, ever stop. It never felt like, okay, we got this thing done. Yeah. There's always something more to do. Yeah. And I think that that is honestly just the truth when you are looking at um, a cause like that. Like if you if if you go into really any field and you work at a not for profit or in the nonprofit world at all and you are fighting for something, Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways that that's a feeling that you have to get used to is like always always sticking you know what i'm gonna broaden that and say that's how it is in music at all times at all times but i would agree i, think, <laughs> I would agree with that <laughs> no matter like no matter where you are yeah in the music world like that's it's just part of it but i think that was the time for me that that really sunk in right um, and it also made me you know it, it forced me to realize that even in rooms that I didn't think I belonged in or deserved to be in, I could figure it out. That's, that's amazing. And isn't it crazy? Why, why do we think that we don't belong there? You are a really wonderfully intelligent, well-spoken young woman. Of course you belong there. And yet there's something in us that tells us that we don't. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's something I still battle um, or try to coexist with, I guess, is mm-hmm. this, this like doubt um, of belonging and, um, you know, sitting at the table. Right. Being enough. <laughs> and, exactly. And I think like the more you do it, the more you start to have moments of like, oh, heck yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm right. the one who did this, you know, you, and there is, there should be and there is no shame in finally like coming to terms with that but um yeah what it, it was a weird awakening experience and one that I I will always be grateful for it was just um I also learned like it wasn't creatively fulfilling enough for me mm, interesting um, although it was you know that position in particular it it was uh eye opening in a lot of ways and and you know, it was close to the cause, right? Which is important. Exactly. It felt yeah. like okay, I am helping songwriters, even though I feel removed from the art a little bit, right? Um, but, so that was interesting. Now, along with that, though, and in this company, I know you worked with a lot of songwriters, and I know that on these trips, a lot of just really amazing songwriters got to go and sit in the room. And is that where you got to meet some of these people? Or tell us a little bit about the journey with the songwriters. And um, just, you know, I mean, songwriters are fantastic. They're, it's just an amazing creative uh, vibe that goes on when you're with them. So give us some information about what you found in that respect. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I have like, I have learned songwriters really, I mean this, they have my heart. Like they have my heart. That's where my heart really is in this industry, I think. But, um, so yeah, it did start. I, it's funny. Like you, you think that you would start along with a bunch of like, you know, 
complete beginners in the craft or whatever. But for me, it was, it kind of worked backwards because when I was doing that administrative stuff, I think you hear this story a lot. If you listen, to, if you listen to enough professionals, I'm talking about like executives and people like that, like, you know, right. leaders, right. they will often tell you that they were secretaries or receptionists or somebody's assistant for a long time. It's funny how uh, you kind of work up the ranks doing that in music mm-hmm. oftentimes like by helping somebody else out which shows me that it's actually <clears throat> it is experience based but a lot of it is personality like if you're just around mm-hmm. the right crowds like you'll get moved up somehow but um anyway so it started out like all of those songwriters that would go with us to dc and like play for men and women of congress right to sway their hearts and that that was pretty powerful i would say i can't um, imagine yeah that was that was remarkable. It it really flew by. And then, you know, there are moments on the ground too in Nashville that I will just never forget because the legislative stuff was ongoing, but I was also, you know, helping with the, the 50th anniversary songwriter awards, um, everything that followed that we had a big music festival, our songwriting festival, all this other stuff. Um, so like, meanwhile, I was doing that stuff too. And it seemed like because of the role I was in, Mm -hmm. I was privy to a lot of information and I was around a lot of big contacts, a lot of big names, um, a lot of big names during that time. And it's, it's the same thing really as the Congress people. It's like, Oh God, I don't deserve to be in the same room as the woman who wrote a bunch of Taylor Swift (laughs) songs, you know, but like, I don't know. It's, I think there's this acceptance that comes where you're like, Oh wait, they're just a person. I'm just a person. We have things that we can laugh about and, you know, joke around and connect on. Um, and we can cry over the same songs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're both just like people. We're both just citizens in Nashville. That's really it. Yeah. Um, and so it started there. It started with, those folks I would say go into those meetings um, and traveling with them Um, I mean I could list you some there's so many there's this like this um, kind of unnerving thing that some people do in Nashville (laughs) (laughs) called called name dropping oh that thing (laughs) yes (laughs) you ever heard of her I've heard one or uh, two yeah (laughs) yeah so uh, I don't I like want to be careful not to be like that but yeah just some really um, power players on the on the industry side too. Yeah. Um, that was you know I may never well I shouldn't say that but th- there were some there were some contacts and some conversations and some meetings that like were just beyond even you know what I could comprehend the, the magnitude of at the time. Wow. Um, Are there any traits or characteristics in this? top group of people, whether it be, you know, legislators or just music elite or songwriters, are there any characteristics that you notice like, oh, leadership in all of these things has a few of these qualities? Did you notice that in anyone? Um, I mean, I, that's pretty complex because I, I picked up on a lot of different kinds of leadership styles. Mm, um, such as? Internally. Um, you know, I've dealt with some who were more direct and to the point, and then I dealt with some who were more, you know, big picture creative, mm-hmm. more so needed just somebody to be in the room and entertain big ideas for hours on end. Um, but I think like common threads in the songwriter community yeah. would more so, uh, it's, it's, this is a topic I could talk about for a long time. So you have to Good. Watch me. We've got all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's it's interesting because every songwriter, no matter no matter what level they're at, has this thing in common about their personality. And it is a soft sort of relationship with their ego. Mm. And it's a complicated thing. Um, but if you are around enough songwriters, which I'm sure you are, you start to notice it. And it's not a bad thing. Yeah. But think about just the complete honesty 
and vulnerability that goes into putting a pen to paper. Right. Every, every single time, even if it's just like a fun ditty, whatever it's like, it's, it's to me is one of the most vulnerable forms of art. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. And, and so like, I don't think that ever goes away. Even if you get to the very tippy top of, you know, the Ashley Gorleys and right, right, Andersons of the world, and I should list more women, but you know, I think that that keeps that keeps going. Um, as for like leaders in the industry, I would say, obviously, there's so many different personalities, and I am still very much getting introduced um but i would one thing i've noticed about the people who are really powerful or really moving towards that space Mm -hmm. is that they all seem to be pretty level-headed and i know earlier i said about like the stereotypes of the music industry being cut through that might have been before we were on yeah but that is while that's true i think there is a um shift in leadership that's happening at least at like you know really respectable companies and growing companies Mm -hmm. and um healthier work cultures um where yeah the leaders are um they're not like ill-tempered i guess that's good to hear Um, yeah and in general i mean seriously I don't know how long have I been here? Five years, six years? Yeah. I really have rarely, rarely come in contact with someone who is just an a hole. Right. <clears throat> you know, and like if they are, they're climbing from the bottom and probably staying there. Right. It's funny. It's like kindness and generosity goes a long way a long way at least in nashville i've heard that la is different new york is different and obviously you know back again the culture right um but the nashville culture i think and and again i'm i don't want to like rose colored glasses this or sugarcoat it in any way yeah but what i have found is that in general, people are willing to help you. People are willing to help teach you. And I think that that is true in the songwriting community and on the industry community and certainly the artist side of things. Now, that doesn't mean that, like, greed is not at play anywhere or that, you know, there are issues. You know, there, there are issues aplenty with the, the way that the industry is set up, which is why yeah. NSAI exists in the first place. Because it's right. like, you know, to yeah. correct this. But I think like on a person to person level, um, I've found that a lot of leaders especially are, you know, genuinely good people. Well, and I think, too, part of leadership, part of good leadership is learning to form a team around you that work well together and that are reliable and trustworthy and show up and go above and beyond. I mean, I know you're one of those people. So that I know plays into everything that you're doing because your work ethic is amazing. And I think when you surround yourself with people like you and others like you, um, that builds a different kind of culture. Yeah, I think, um, I guess on the, it's a community, right? Like, Mm -hmm. even, even beyond just the office that you work in, Nashville in particular is a small town. Yes. Really, the music industry is a small town. Yeah, the whole thing is, yes. (laughs) It's, it's a complex web of, of moving pieces Mm -hmm. but you know names repeat in communities Mm -hmm. and people serve different roles in different communities and that that is kind of fluid yeah but what stays the same is like your your reputation 
as being, like you said, having a good work ethic or like having a, a positive um, mentality or, um, you know, being people like to say this thing like the hang like you have to have a good hang yeah and so a lot of it really is social um but i yeah i appreciate you saying that about my work ethic because that's i think that's like one thing i can be proud of (laughs) oh you can be proud of many things (laughs) many many things but yes that is you know you always Sorry, I live on a loud street and occasionally we get the loud car. <laughs> um, you always showed up prepared and overprepared and you were the first one there and the last one to leave. And uh, that, you know, that speaks highly in a business world and having, you know, having people on the team like you, uh, that's valuable. That's very valuable. Yeah, I think so after um, after I was assistant for a year and a half I got moved into a membership role which was more creative um you know it was more it was more um closely related to the writers and their progress and their craft etc um and a short time after that I was moved to director of membership wow and so I at that point did work with the team um you know, and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> so and shut down navigating. the world. <laughs> totally. And everything that I was planning and doing in membership was related to like in person large scale events, like you know, seminars and conferences and things. Right. Um so shifting that and having these people on my team who were incredible like they were like me you know yeah. um, and that's why they were there that's why they made it so to speak um too like me because they were smart and they were at their respective colleges probably the, the same type of people you know right, that right. showed up to stay late and and those people um it's so easy to get a read on like who is that and who's not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. Because like not everybody that I've worked with in my whole career has been amazing like that. But those those standouts, I'll tell you what, those are the like every quality that you just said. It's like those are the reasons that I was able to be a leader there mm-hmm. because I had I had people with those qualities on the team. Um, And it made it a lot of fun. And I think that's so important. Like even, even despite the pandemic, I was having so much fun because, um, you know, we were turning things virtual and whatever. Um, Working from home. Hello. Got some work-life balance. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I got a lot of yoga pants out at 20. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of yoga pants, a lot of dog walks, which I I think. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was great. But yeah, no, I think it was, um, because I had good people surrounding me at that time, mm-hmm. you know, made it more than bearable. It was fun. Right. You know? Right. So what prompted then, because now you are at, um, banner music, correct? Yeah, that's right. So how did you make the move? So after the pandemic, you were still there and doing functions, um, festivals and events for NSAI, What prompted the move and how did all that transpire? Well, it was a lot of things. Um, I had been there a while, you know, I had, I had flexed just about every single muscle that you could No, pretty much every single one. Like I maybe, I didn't do our budgeting for the whole company. And I certainly, you know, hats off to, to Jennifer Turnbow and, and Bart who, did the policy right. but um and my friend Brittany Talley who's still there doing marketing but like even every single bit of it I touch yeah and there gets a point where you sorry getting another call there gets a point where you can't move up anymore 
Right. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing if you land where you definitely want to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and in a sense, like leaving was really, really tough because I bet I love the team. I, you know, I really love the songwriters. Right. Um, to an extreme, like to where I, that was removing myself was really hard. And I like to talk about this like privilege that I had that everybody who, who has a position like that has where you are helping songwriters and artists really in all kinds of genres and all kinds of styles and all kinds of stages in their life and in Mm -hmm. their career and in their journey as a writer um and producers too you know like just seeing all these different facets and you get to experience it all alongside them to whatever degree works out for them you know some of them are super involved for a year and then you don't hear from them mm-hmm. except once after that or whatever or there's some people that from the time i started to the time i left and even now like we regularly keep in touch but it's like it's it's weird because you get so close and so invested in all of their their paths but there were so many of them there were like 4,000 members and I would say like a couple hundred were like yeah so a a couple hundred of them were like pretty involved um and so you only can be so involved you know what I mean Mm -hmm. like when you have that many so it's like I I loved it I loved being part of it but I I couldn't really get super invested in one person's career like it becomes too big and too overwhelming, too much. It was too much. And it, it was like, I want to be closer to the art. I want to be closer to like this process and also just not get stuck. I don't want to be stuck in one position or at one organization. That I haven't like spread my wings. I don't know what else I am capable of yet. Right. Um, that's so hard. I, yeah, it was, it was a tough choice. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I could talk more about that, but that's like probably another episode about like <laughs> workplace stuff. But um, well, so how did you get associated with Banner? Do you did so, you know these people, or did they recruit you? Did they was it a little bit of that? Like they, you know, said, "Hey, if you ever are looking for a." anything like that or how did you meet them so this is this is going to be an interesting response like honestly because well this isn't like super public i guess but i i had conversations with other companies throughout my time at nsai Mm -hmm. i never took anybody else up on anything except for like you know side gigs here and there right Um, i did a lot of like writing writing and transcribing and editing and stuff in that time um not songwriting but like copy right um and i did some personal assistant work for some like big artists and things like that like i did stuff on the side which by the way is something you can do like if you're a student listening to this i always thought you could only do one thing but you can do more than one thing um at one time but anyway I was thinking not long ago about how, like, how those things came to be. And I got to be honest with you. I never have shown anyone my resume. Really? And that is why I think that's, this is going to be an interesting response for, like, <laughs> students in particular. Sorry, sorry to the resume class that we're, that we're sorry, going through all of class. our writing our resumes. <laughs> Look, that's an important life skill. It's an important life skill. Yeah. One thousand percent. If for nothing else, for the very reason to like personally visualize what all you can do and have done and keep doing. So like Mm -hmm. I do update mine on occasion, but I am telling you, my resume did not get me my career in music. Well, I mean, I and I I say this, my classes are sick to death of hearing me say it. So I'll say it here again. But networking is king. 
It's yeah. who you know in this industry. A hundred thousand percent. Yep. And the reputation that you have that precedes you. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly it. So that's basically what happened is um, I, so I was, I was interviewing with a couple different positions and um, also I had just gotten married. So it was like, it, it felt like a good time to make a shift in my career anyway it was kind of mm -hmm. like okay let's who do I want to be now <laughs> <laughs> but um I was having a couple conversations and some of them were like more admin driven and like um and by admin I'm talking about like the part of the industry where you register copyrights and you deal with the PROs and right um which ironically now I'm like totally in swamped in that at banner but um mm -hmm. but anyway so I was like comparing all these and um, I basically just had a friend who said, Hey, I know you're, you were looking at some things and, um, a friend of mine is looking to bring on someone on her team. And so it was like, actually the day that I gave my notice to NSAI, which I gave them a, a longer notice. Cause I knew, I knew that that transition was going to be tough. Like mm -hmm. it, I had been there a long time. I had a lot of institutional knowledge. Right. Um, they had to go somewhere. So, um, so I think I gave them like three weeks or like a month or something. So that afternoon I talked with Kamala, who is now, who I work for now. Um, and she, it was just a phone call like this and, you know, we just sort of got along. I remember she like pulled over to get, go through a drive through and get ribs, like barbecue ribs. That's awesome. Way. And I was like, well, that's a good sign. Like, she's feeling pretty laid back and hungry and, like, craving some BBQ. I can respect right. that. <laughs> right. Um, so that was a good sign. And then, you know, it was funny. She she was like, yeah, I mean, Casey, our, my friend who, who connected us, she said so many good things about you. And, you know, she goes, I, I know that we also have, we have, like, 50-something mutual Facebook friends or something crazy. Oh, wow. So she was like, so I asked, you know, some of those people about you and everything everybody had good things to say so what you're saying is a hundred percent true and that confirms it but so she was like um i heard those things you know and she goes the thing is i've already offered a job to someone else oh man <laughs> like i had already i had been i had got into her ear too late which was like i was like oh, okay interesting well you know thanks for taking the call anyway you know i'm juggling a bunch of different interviews right now anyway so it's yeah. fun and um that person didn't work out. And I had told Kimla that on the phone. I was like, Hey, I, you know, I have heard good things about you. I had more than one friend who had worked under her or worked with her before. I just didn't know it at the time, but mm -hmm. I had contacts. I had contacts that I could ask or get coffee with or whatever. So, you know, she vetted me. I vetted her. You know, that's, that's what you do. You say, Hey, what do you, what do you think of this? Um, and it was all, you know, positive. It was all positive. And so, um, you know, I, I had that conversation with her a couple times over the phone and then, um, we met in person and, you know, we really hit it off. She's, she's such a sweetheart and, um, she's a small town girl, you know, and, mm -hmm. and she, she totally built herself up from the ground. Like she started pitching her husband's songs like almost four years ago and has just completely built her own career in publishing, um, and in management now. So, and in in publishing admin now so she's she really has done a lot in her career and i was like this would be awesome to learn you know from her um so that was almost a year ago to the day that i started um so yeah it was all interpersonal it was all conversation based you know energy based i yeah, guess yeah um, and for me it was like the selling point really was you'll be the operations manager. So it's a small company, but you'll get to oversee everything. Oh, wow. Um, and I was like, that is what I want because I want to see how it really literally works. Right. How it really literally works. And so the past year, that's what I've been doing. Um, and also Banner has a booking agency. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's very, very small. I can't stress that enough. It's, we're a really small company, but, um, you know, we have a lot of movement and we, I have learned how to, 
I've watched, you know, up close and personal with, with, um, bookings, like huge buy, sell deals. Right. I have. And for our people that are listening that may not know what a buy, sell deal is, can you explain that? Yeah. So basically like if a talent buyer, um, at like a festival or a big venue or something is like, they're just looking for talent in like in general. Mm -hmm. Um, you have a booking agent who will like deal with that transaction. So they'll, the booking agent will go and talk to their other agent friends or their artists that they have and try to, you know, try to get whoever they want. And then oftentimes like the company or the agent or both will keep a commission on it. And then Mm -hmm. like, basically just like run, run the money through us so that neither party has to deal with the other. So like, you know, if, if, um, I think of a good artist name because I don't want to like incriminate anyone. I don't know like how things ended up. So let's just say artist a (laughs) artist a is like going to be booked at this big venue. And it's like, it's a baseball stadium, Mm -hmm. but the buyer like really doesn't know anything about the music industry. They just own this venue Mm -hmm. and they reach out to the agency or like there's a relationship there. Again, another point for networking. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that agent is like, Oh, you're a fan of art artist. A like, let me see what I can do. And they facilitate that deal. Okay. So I got to see that and learn up close about that. Um, and also from like the, the, the talent buying side, like I went to so many of those conferences where you like set up a booth and you're a vendor and you talk to like your local fairs and festivals across the Midwest (laughs) about, you know, what talent you have to offer. Right. Fairs and festivals. So I got to see all that up close and personal. So what, Um, um, from an artist and, you know, of course I have a lot of students, what does a talent buyer, one of these people um, looking for in an act? Um, well, a lot of times at these like conventions that they have, they do showcases. Mm -hmm. And so like they'll get together and talk about their policies for the year or whatever. And then at the end, there's like artist showcases and you have maybe like three songs or maybe six, um, while they're eating their dinner Mm -hmm. and you, you just have to put on a freaking good show. Yeah. Really. Um, you know, it helps if you're looking at something in your area or you've played their festival before which i know is like a chicken and egg kind of thing right (laughs) like if you if you if you if i were to say to an artist that's like trying to break into that circuit um first of all like it helps to it does help to have an agent but again that's also like which comes first Mm -hmm. um but play just playing as much as you can locally Mm -hmm. and then getting into like play your county fair, honestly, and then, or, you know, your local events, and then somebody will hear you that books or hear of you that books something else at some other random place. And it just sort of grows. I think right. organically. Yeah. But then, you know, if you, you get to a certain point and then you play those showcases, I mean, it's, it really is just one way to break into that one very specific kind of artistry and performance yeah. like if you love to play live and you want to travel across specifically the midwest and the south um then it's totally a, a cool circuit to break into and it's you know pays well mm-hmm. pays well so um yeah i would say if i were talking to an artist i would say like play locally and full band shows as often as you can even if it's like an investment for a while it will you know, it'll start to pay off if, yeah. you, if you can book yourself regularly, which I'm sure, you know, you can speak to that too. Right. But it's really nice to hear, um, again, for my students that are listening to have some, you know, reinforcement of someone who's up there right now and in there doing this, doing this exact thing, you know, <laughs> this is great. Oh, yeah. Well, one thing I learned for sure is that I do not want to be a booking agent. <laughs> <laughs> like, you and me it, both. <laughs> it's, oh my God. It's, I think, you know, I may someday do it on like a a different scale or like if I were if I were working at a venue or a festival, mm-hmm. 
I think that'd be one thing, but like working on behalf of the artist is really, really tricky yeah. um, in booking specifically for me. Now I, I have obviously seen people do it and do amazingly well at it. Mm-hmm. Um, not to mention like it's one of the only areas in the industry that you get commissioned from. Right. So like those people work super hard and then you like get a couple big deals and then you can like take the whole month of December off if you want. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's totally a viable career path if anybody wants to do it, but here's how you do it. You get an internship at a booking agency. There's a couple like major ones and then you become an assistant to an agent. Right. And then you stay there long enough and then you'll become an agent. Mm -hmm. Like that's, there's, that's how you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have students who are interested on that side of things, I, I would recommend looking like doing some research on the agencies that have the talent that they're interested in, because right. it, it definitely helps if you believe in the act. You have to enjoy the music that's on their roster to really have again. And we talked about this before we recorded, but having that why and having that passion and mm-hmm. that thing that really motivates you because this is hard. It's hard to pitch an artist. It's hard to work on the on behalf of someone. And there's a lot of no's before you get a yes, you know? Yeah. So. A hundred percent. Yeah. And like being that mitigator is a really important role. And I like, I have, okay. So I'm basically, here's my list. I learned about the agency side of things. I learned, I have learned about um, distribution, like actually you know, putting music out and the mm-hmm. options that go into that. Um, publishing both creative and administrative at this point now, luckily. Mm-hmm. Um, business operations and accounting. Wow. Um, and most of all, this shining star for me is writer management and artist management. Oh, very cool. Um, so, yeah, talk to us about that. What is So you do day-to-day kind of management stuff with artists or do you have your own artist at this point well some of that um okay so some of what banner does and the reason i brought it up is because like being the liaison on a booking end is so much different than on the management side because on the booking side you sign a paper get that paperwork done like so this is to the students if you feel like you like to if you're good at negotiating If you're good at advocating and then good at like letting something go and you want a fast moving thing that you just go on to the next project, go on the next booking, mm-hmm. go into book. If you like to be involved with like the nitty gritty, go into management. Yes. Um, because management's like the project, again, it, it doesn't really end. Like you, you can't just like shut that down and move on to the next thing. It's, it's all the time. So Banner does like management services. So we have one artist that we manage, manage, um, and then we have several, and we've had several come and go that like need our management services for, you know, a specific time period or a project or release or whatever. Most of the time, it's like for, I guess you would consider it day to day, um, for like extended periods of time, um. And that I've really come to love. I didn't think that I would love it as much, but, um, you know, you get really invested in people's careers and, you know, it's, it's problem solving. Somebody explained it to me this way one time, and it really helped me wrap my head around what management is. So I'm saying artists, but I really mean writers too, because again, going back to the first thing I said, songwriters have my heart. So like the end of the day, even if, which nowadays is another topic we can talk about nowadays. So many artists are also writers, mm-hmm. like they're one and the same. Um, but, you know, just so you know, that's, I mean both when I say this, but okay. basically you have the artist at the, the, the center of the circle and then you have like their holistic view of their life. Like there's a circle around them. Mm-hmm. And there's all these different categories of their life and their career that they need to like meet certain points. Um, and, you know, it's it's anything from press and media to performance to vocal training to writing to mm-hmm. networking, everything. Um, and every single creator, I think this is true for, for producers, too. Every single one of them has areas where 
they hit a boundary and that circle can't be fully complete. Right. Like it's, it looks uneven, you know, Mm -hmm. and management basically comes in and fills out those, those unmet needs and like, like exceeds the boundary of what the artist can do. Well, sure, because it's so hard to do everything by yourself, you know? It's so hard. It's so hard. And like, I always have a lot of admiration for people who at least feel like they're doing it completely alone. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that like nobody, hopefully nobody is really, truly alone. Like if you have family and friends that are supporting you by like clicking on your Instagram when you're posting it, like that's help. Too. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. that's your community, that's your people. But I'm talking about like on in terms of like actually working right for them and with them. Um, it's an um, it's an amazing thing what management can do for those artists. And I don't think that it's right for every artist. Like, you know, there are probably students who like think, oh, that wouldn't that be awesome if I could just get management right now. Well, it's unlikely. Yes. It's un- and why have, like, why is that? Life. Tell them why that is, please. Well, for one thing, it's the same thing. It's the same conversation as like when you're looking at, oh, I want a record deal. You know, it's not that like your talent isn't there. It's that the industry on my side of the desk also is measuring that full circle for you. Mm-hmm. And if you come in and like one thing is significantly weaker, like for instance, you know a ton of people in Nashville. You know people in New York. You know you've got people in London, and you you have a ton of contacts, but you ain't writing but one song a year. Right. I mean, that's exaggerating, but it's like you have to sort of sort of show that you are are driven enough to like stick out from the white noise of just like everyone is a creator now. Right. Yeah, And it's like, I have this thing that I like to say, especially to, uh, when I was in NSI, I, I created this thing called Rise, and it was like a six-week educational course, and mm-hmm. I used to say it, especially to my teenagers, but it's, it's like, when music is your, when music is in your life and you have that bug, you know what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. you, have, you have that bug, you have to find some way to make room for music, and you have to find some way to let it manifest in your life. Mm-hmm. You have to. You have to do it. You can't avoid it. The difference in making a career out of it and a hobby out of it. And I think there's like completely viable careers where you like, you never leave your town, you know, you Mm -hmm. you just play locally. Like, and I think that's completely noble. In fact, a lot of our clients for management services are doing that. Here's the difference. They have funding. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So <laughs> they have a really good day job. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So they're able to afford it. To afford it. So if you can't afford it and you're coming looking for management services and you don't have that, and frankly, I mean it is a business. Like you mm-hmm. know, we have to earn too. So we have to believe that you are gonna be like the act that's gonna get broken and that's gonna go really, really far. And in a way you kind of have to earn your stripes. Like no matter what age you are Mm -hmm. or your demographic or anything like that, like you have to sort of prove that holistic viewpoint as, as your own mission Mm -hmm. before I think most managers will start considering. Now there are definitely like some scammy people out there who will be like, Oh, work with me, pay me and I'll get you a record deal. And like, you ever hear that run Run. (laughs) that's not real yeah um so yeah it is important to sort of build that on your own or not not completely on your own but you know organically i guess Mm -hmm. is the better word um before trying to jump completely in um and with that said like we have we have worked with artists who have only ever released one song but there that's a different sort of business model. Well, and, you know, I think too, and I'm running into this, I'm it's the first time I'm teaching uh, the record company class where it's really about the business side of this. And I think people coming into the class were sort of shocked at, wait, what? <laughs> we're not just going to like sit around and talk about music 
all semester? Well, no, there's a whole other side of it that has to be, it's a business. This is the music business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's that saying that's like, it's, it's not called the music music. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a fun thing to come to terms with, I think, for artists and writers, especially. Yeah. And I mean, you have to have uh, you have to have evidence to back up what you're saying. You know, if you have eight million, you know, Spotify <laughs> plays or whatever, but um, and you're you're wanting to play in, I don't know, Nebraska or something, but none of your followers are in Nebraska. Well, you may not get booked in Nebraska because you don't have anyone you don't have a market there. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think n not a lot of people are looking at what the business people are actually interested in. Can you fill the venue? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a hard, it's a hard thing. And I think it, it honestly parallels with writers who are wanting like a publishing deal. Yes. Um, because you kind of get clouded in this, like, oh, my God, wouldn't it be nice if somebody else was just paying my bills and I could just write songs full time? And it's like, first of all, there's a lot of caveats to that. Um, and secondly, like, getting to that point is so, such a giant adventure for a lot of people. <laughs> right. Um, and it's not going to happen for everybody. And that's the deal. It maybe isn't supposed to and the same thing with record deals like maybe it isn't what's meant to help your career right. um but i would say like your example artist a wants to play in nebraska well that's not unrealistic that can totally be done get you a good friend who's in college or something <laughs> like <laughs> interested in learning how to do management or work on the executive side somehow who can sit down with you and plan that out and say how can we take this big giant thing and break it down into smaller goals mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. let's do, let's get into that get into that agency world a little bit more um or you know play a little locally a little closer out there or whatever yeah. um there's ways to make things in your career feasible yes to a degree if you have, if everything else lines up, if you're like, if your holistic circle view of your life and career is looking pretty healthy, you know, if you have a great attitude about things, if you are in the right places at the right times, if you, if your art is really speaking for itself, you're not having to convince people to listen to you because your music is good enough, you know, mm -hmm. all those things can pretty much, you know, land you at the next goal that you want to take it's just like i don't know it's it's a tricky balance of like managing expectation within that right right well it's a lot of um i love this saying too you know uh, opportunity knocks and hard work comes to answer the door <laughs> mm -hmm. you know it, it's putting in the work and the the footsteps on your own first um in order to to get to the place where you can you know show some sustainability. Wow. That was hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so how would you recommend, because, uh, people, you know, I have a lot of students too, that are really, um, young emerging songwriters and everybody throws this around. Oh, I'm just going to get a publishing deal. What would, mm -hmm. what would your advice be to young songwriters, um, who want that kind of, you know, that want to get somewhere and have people pay them to write songs. How do you do that? Well, okay. Let's break this down. Okay. Because the first thing to really consider is why do you want a deal? Why do you want a pub deal? Mm -hmm. Because again, I think people get this sort of idea in their heads like, Oh, it's, I'm just going to have it like it's a full-time job and I want to go there. But if you don't understand what publishing is or your publishing means mm -hmm. you're not ready to have those conversations with publishers and they're not going to have those conversations with you so i would really encourage 
you to sit down and think about why do I want to deal? Well, you say, okay, well, I want to deal because I love to write songs and that's all I want to do all day, every day. Okay. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to do fun stuff all day, every day. (laughs) Not that songwriting (laughs) is all fun. Um, But, and then I think the next step from there is to make yourself aware of the sort of ebb and flow of the companies out there. Mm Mm-hmm. Notice where they're based. Spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. Most of them are here. (laughs) And, like, you have to think about... I I do not like the advice of, like, move to Nashville. I think that is um, not fair because not everybody can. Some people have families that they need to be with. And some people love their communities. And some people really like making music in the place they're in. And that's, I think, totally fair and valid. And I, I think that should be like more celebrated, in fact. But I think that also needs to come with a reality check because you it is so, so, so unlikely. Like I think I think you have a better chance. I think I personally, me, Leah, have a better chance of like making it onto the Tennessee Titans team next year than you have a chance of getting a publishing deal when you are not living in Nashville. Wow. <laughs> That's, really tell us how it is leah <laughs> like it is truly it is so hard there's yeah. so many limited it's limited spots and here's the real reality you're going up against 65 to seventy thousand songwriter citizens of nashville wow seventy thousand. i would say i would wager seventy thousand. i would say I think a couple of years ago when I did the math on this, it was like 60,000, 65. Jeez. And with the amount of people moving here, I would mm-hmm. say that's, that's who you're up against. Now, now all those people are not all going for the same things, obviously, but uh, there's writer's rounds right now. When I'm t- having this conversation with you, it's seven at night. Mm-hmm. There are like, there's a hundred songs being written right now in town mm. and probably a hundred more being played. Jeez. And so, like, I think coming to terms with that reality of, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice? Like, yes, it would also be nice to, you know, be a starring actor on The Office and you've never acted before. Like, right. it, it, yes, it, it's a noble pursuit. And I don't want to shame anybody from doing that. But you have to understand the, like, likelihood of it happening. Um, and... Well, and publishing is, um, I'm just, confusing is not even, doesn't even do it justice to me. I am confused by all of the publishing world. It's really nebulous and hard to understand. <laughs> it is nebulous. And I'm telling you, like, I, I worked at Banner for a while before I really started to get it a handle. Yeah. And I still don't think that I like there were plenty of people plenty of amazing mentors leadership things panels I went to podcasts I listened to they explained it to me and I still didn't freaking really grasp it yeah <laughs> I really didn't. and I still I still like respect it for being so complex as part of like you know Robert likes to say that the money's in the publishing which is true mm-hmm. um and I wish I had like a flashcard way of putting it, but basically what I've learned is that it is everything else, everything else about a song that isn't the melody and lyrics themselves. Mm-hmm. So it's information and the distribution of that information to the entities that get that thing to the market and get it to, you know, um, copyrighted material. Mm-hmm. They get it to the artist that may perform it. Um, it's it's basically filling the rest of the the gap there. Um, and a lot of publishers now are looking are like, first of all, signing writers who are also artists mm-hmm. I mentioned that earlier um 
And they're also, publishing companies are launching management or like artist development arms. Right. It's not, it does like the book does, just doesn't stop with just publishing. And it, traditionally, I think what you and I learned and what, what we have thought about publishing is like this song plugging thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Pitching. Pitching um, and like managing a catalog. Mm-hmm. And that is part of it. But I will tell you, pitching is sort of dying down. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a really cool article that came out, I think, in Music Row publication a couple weeks ago. This would be a really great resource, actually. It it was written by Ben Vaughn um, from Warner. And he talks about, like, how important it is for artists to cut outside songs. Mm -hmm. Because that sort of has been dying down and, like... Because that's dying down, these positions of pluggers, unless they're, like, independent, whatever, but um, that position has sort of changed in -hmm. in a lot of ways. So, uh, and that, for people, like, interested in the music business, I know that a lot of people look at the positions of song plugger, you know, publishing on the pitching side. Right. Also known as, like, a creative director. It's, like, a common... uh, Right. You know, name for it or a and r um are positions that are like really flashy and a lot of people want them and i was actually like discouraged from pursuing a and r before i even started my internship and i wish that i had been more encouraged to learn more about it earlier but it is also something that's i don't say i, I wouldn't say it's going away but it's changing a lot mm-hmm, um i think because yeah. like if you look at the charts, especially if you're, we're talking about like mainstream music, you know, this is different from like how indie labels maybe operate, but even like indie artists, as you know, they're writing their own stuff. They yeah. really are. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think maybe it is universal, but it, it, either way, it's like traditionally you would have your publisher kind of like in book publishing. Mm-hmm. Like you have that, you have somebody who's like your champion, you know? Mm-hmm. Um but that person then sort of exploits their contacts and their relationships with A and R people at different labels, mm-hmm. um, and you know sits in front of them at this very scary conference room and plays them a CD, and like that's the traditional model, right? Um, and that is sort of changing to more of a co-write thing. Um, that's another big thing that I, I have really learned since being at Banner, because even at NSAI, like, that's the model. That's the model that we were taught. Um, and for so long, it was true. You know, like, you have a song in your catalog, and your creative director goes through, and they make pitches based on the artist that they're pitching for. Now, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong, I have done this. I have done it. Yeah. Um, and I've seen it. And I know it still sort of happens. But if you really look closely, I implore you all to listen to the songs that you love the most and look at the song credits and look who wrote it. Um, Because more often than not, especially in, you know, mainstream of all genres, the artist is on there. Right. The artist was in that room. Um, In Nashville, if you're in the room, you get equal share. Um, Not always the case. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, in LA, that's not always the case, or, or New York, or wherever else you know pop music is being created. Um, that's not always the case, or you know other genres. But I would say, like, you know, the pop, the CCM, the country, the the y alternative or Americana, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. in, in Nashville that's coming out. You know, everything. You've got a writer who is the artist. Yes. And so if you think about that logically, it's like, okay, I'm seeing patterns here. These, not only as a writer, not only is the artist listed as writer, but um, these co-writers are the same people Mm, mm -hmm. on a lot of different songs. And it may be the same 10 people, you know, for um, not to just like only talk about country music, but like Luke Bryan, for instance, if you look like, oh, those people are the same dudes. They're the same guys. Mm -hmm. And pitching to that, is just not feasible. Like even if even if you're at like a well-known publishing company, I mean, again, it does happen, but more often than not, you're pitching for co-writes. Wow, because, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It is, and it's not a cataloged song usually. It's like, hey, let's get Luke Bryan together with artist A, and 
Yes. They can have a song together. Yeah. And then you hope and pray that he loves that song enough to put it on his album. Yeah. To put to record it and then yeah, and then put it out. And so like I now am getting very close to some major cuts, which hopefully on our next podcast episode I can announce. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a it is a game. Yeah. Like it's a game and it is very hard. So to think about that in terms of like the writer's career, you know, and to to think about how how daunting that is, like also um, how evolving it is. Oh, yeah. Constantly changing. It's like you want to learn as much as you can about that because you'll be empowered from it. Mm-hmm. Um, but not only that, it'll help you understand like how that how that actually relates to your career. Because if you are somebody who like just wants to write songs for other people, like you don't see yourself as a performer, mm-hmm. that's a longer ladder to climb. Mm. And it's a noble thing. It's a noble thing. In fact, I love writer writers. Right. I love writer writers. They're my favorite because they really are honest. Yeah. And good. And they're really good. They're, they're typically empathetic. They're really good at like telling other people's stories in the mm-hmm. room. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say if you're like a writer, writer and you're thinking about, okay, I want to like be a national circuit. Maybe you don't want to live here. Maybe you want to just visit enough to make it, you know, a possibility. Well, you have to get really good at co-writing. Because then how else are you going to get cuts? Right. Right. Because ain't, ain't nobody pitching your songs yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's also, it sort of goes back to, I mean, you have to get the co-writes, but then you have to have the networking in place to be able to get the co-writes. So it goes back to, again, you have to be there and you have to be in the scene. Right? You do. Well, you do. And I think you... I've, I've worked over the years with people who were not living in Nashville. So I do want to like, again, stress that I, that my, my advice is not move to Nashville. Right. But I think there is a way, I think like the benefit of co-writing is beyond measure at this point. For one mm-hmm. thing, it's pitching, it is pitching your songs, like I said, but it, it also manufactures the networking right because if you've ever co-written a song that's the most honest moments mm-hmm. it is the most honest moments like not only are you putting a pen to paper but you're telling people in the same room your ideas yeah. it's a freaking scary thing it's a scary terrifying thing but think about this if you co-write with other people in auburn or troy or you know buffalo new york mm-hmm. and you do it a lot and you try out different people and then you learn like what strengths you like in the other people, what mm-hmm. strengths you have yourself that you bring to the room or like what's your, what makes you tick? Like some people really love having three people in the room. Yeah. Some people, we call them track people. Some people like are, you know, producers of their own right and they like to be in the room and create a track and let me tell you something those people are so valuable so oh, if, you're yeah. audio, if you're in audio classes right now and you like it even a little bit freaking learn it yeah yeah learn it and never forget it because that makes you so immensely valuable in the room because then you can walk away the whole the whole group gets to walk away with a work tape a really good work tape or demo we actually are in the process of, it's funny you should say that, we're in the process of, um, we're going to go record four songs for the commercial ensemble at Auburn, and one of the guys does that, and so we broke into our four different, you know, groups of people that are doing these songs, and I walked upstairs into the studio, and they've got half the track already done. I mean, just yep. the demo, but that's the exact thing, so for Thursday, for tomorrow's class, they walk in with a full, you know, arranged, here's our basic idea, and then it gets to grow from there, which is really cool. Oh, it's really cool. It's really cool. Um, You know, that's, that was another thing I wanted to mention in publishing too, is like, you know, 
they do the co-write let's say that you do get a big co-write with an artist or you get uh, what i really do is like get a lot of co-writes with independent and up up and coming artists Mm -hmm. uh, which is different from like the level of up and coming in nashville is a little bit different than just like anywhere you know like Mm -hmm. when i say up and coming like i still want to see like several thousand streams (laughs) right (laughs) but um in general but anyway bring them in there and then pay usually like we'll pay for a demo to be created on that. If we mm-hmm. really want the artist to fall in love with it, because then they get to hear it. They maybe get to hear their voice on it. Mm-hmm. And it's like more likely that they'll cut it. Right. Um, I hope none of the indie artists that I work with are listening to this, but anyway, <laughs> it's like, that's, that's, this, that's the strategy. It's like to get them to fall in love with it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you have a track person in the room from the beginning, you don't have to go through that stuff. And it is financially valuable. Like, so publishing companies love it. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, la- the labels love it because you can do it on your own and you can really, really build a whole career just being a track guy. Yeah. Yeah. You really can. And like an amazing career. Really important. Very important skill. Super important. And then if you don't, I would say if you're not like, if you're like, well, I don't really want to produce for other people, but, you know, maybe I could try to take this audio tech class. Take it. Yeah. Take it. <laughs> Learn it. Learn it. Even like no matter what place in the industry you think you might want to go, freaking learn it because, um, developing that now like Mm -hmm. as an as an adult who's working who is once you're out of college basically and you don't have that resource (laughs) it is a lot more difficult to sit down and get spend the time energy money on learning that skill so like while you have it i would say that that's the you know one of one of the most essential things if you're interested at all in like the creative songwriting artistry side because then you can always like create your own demos for you even if it's just a piano vocal you know how to mix it right enough mix it enough to get the point across like nobody really out here is looking for like amazing demos i promise you they they are not we want to hear like do the lyrics make sense am i understanding the melodic flow of things Mm -hmm. um maybe if it's a pop song you might have some other elements in there but like by and large it, it really is less is more but it needs to be like a clear less is more. And if you can bring that to the table mm-hmm. yourself as an artist, as a writer, like that just goes so much further, I think, than is like often talked about. So yeah, um, highly, highly encourage that skill. Wow. Um, I, don't, I don't know where I got off on that. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many things. We are going to have to do another podcast. <laughs> because there's so much more I want to talk to you about and I don't want to keep you all night but I also you know in the networking and I just want to mention these two things and I don't know if you're still involved but I've been you know reading and you know stalking you online for this interview Um, and you're a part of Solid and also Women's Music Business Association are you still you're associated with both of those? Yes they're really really fun so um, WNBA not to be confused with basketball. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> um, I, you know, looking at me, you can tell I, I would be really good at basketball because um, of my height. <laughs> 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 but um, it's, a, it's a really cool source of, of connections and things. And um, my involvement really has been mostly geared towards community service. Um, and in fact, we just did a project with the Gilda's Club, um, mm. which you probably have heard of. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a cancer resource yeah. facility, um, really amazing organization. Um, so WMBA has been awesome for that and like networking things. And I'm actually going to another event with them next week. Um, but Solid, I have totally, totally like fallen in love with. Um, and actually like we should have follow-up conversations about solid because they have a mentorship program that oh. can extend to Auburn. Oh, uh, that would, yeah. 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 We, we will talk about on, that. <laughs> it's one-on-one mentoring, which I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and I actually am like over the course of me being here, I have given, or I've, I've hired two interns from my mentees. Oh, wow. 
so like it, it is gr- a great funnel for 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 internships too um fantastic so solid is a leadership um development group and last year i served on the music market um committee as co-chair and i basically learned it's all it is a nonprofit, um, mm-hmm. which obviously my heart is for songwriters and apparently it's also for nonprofits. Um, so I, I did like the fundraising for the organization itself. Um, last this, this year, 2022. Um, and it has been incredibly rewarding, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, because I don't know if you've ever had to like fundraise, mm-hmm. goals, but it's freaking hard. Um, next year and i'm not sure when you're going to post this podcast i don't know when this will be announced but it will be announced soon but anyway i'm going to be running i'm going to be the chair person for um community outreach which is wow like, oh, yeah i'm so excited congratulations um, that's that's amazing that's awesome and gosh just uh, so necessary in our world right now just that's fantastic I am so excited about it. So every year, Solid picks five um, like community organizations to partner with, and we fundraise like throughout the year. Mm-hmm. And this is this is a separate fundraising. Um, and at the end of the year, those funds are um, distributed to each organization, and and it's like really amazing causes. Like the NAMAM was on it two years ago, which is the National Museum of African American Music, mm. um, the Equity Alliance, the Store, the Onsite Foundation, ACM wow. Living Lives, like all these really incredible um, organizations. So I'm really really excited about that opportunity. Um, you know, it's funny like the extracurriculars don't really stop. When you're out of right. college, I kind of thought that was like, why would I invest my time in this now? Because, you know, when I get into the real world, it's like not even a thing. Uh, it is a thing. Um, and it Solid has been so cool in connecting me with other leaders who are about my level of leadership. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're like, they're the next generation, I would say, of like executives and things. Wow. Um, and so it's really amazing, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk, uh, you know, sidebar about the mentorship program. Definitely. I think last year, the past two years, they've like doubled the amount of universities that they've reached. Wow. Um, yeah. And this past year, I think we've hit 165 colleges, if I'm wow. not mistaken. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. And so basically, you know, we, we, pair students one-on-one with a mentor and it's like for a semester you meet they meet like maybe two to three times although I will say one of the one of the mentees I had like we created well two of them I think one of them I gave an internship another one I had in a similar opportunity and we had such a great relationship that I think we were meeting like every other week wow that so you know i'm i don't i can't speak for her but it was incredibly rewarding for me um and it's another great contact to have you know fantastic so yes yeah yeah i love solid i love solid well that's awesome well we will do uh, we're we're just gonna have to do another podcast because like i said i we can talk for three more hours but (laughs) i know you just got home and you have dogs and a life and you know your husband (laughs) is there he probably would like to see you this evening (laughs) Yeah, he, he can deal with it. That's life in the music biz, baby. He's it is. Music. It is. He's used to it. <laughs> yeah, he's the cause of it a lot of times. That's the other <laughs> thing. Like, marry a guitar player and see what happens, you know? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I know nothing about that. <laughs> Well, Leah, this oh my god, there's so much in here. There's you've just given so much uh, great advice and just great insights and tips. Uh, this has really been fantastic. Thank you so very much for sharing yeah. all of that and your time and your passion and your heart. So, I have one last question for you: Is what is your why? What is your purpose? <laughs> what's your purpose? My purpose. Por- my yeah, what's your purpose? Um. I, I will say this and I want to caveat it. Um, 
I think music is the thing that I like best. And and that's that's pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all, you know, we all have to build a career of some way. And when I sit down to think about that even now and I think like that's it, you know, music is the thing I like to do best. Mm-hmm. So why not if there are opportunities out there, like why not make the most of those in the space that I can, but I will caveat that by saying that's not my life's purpose. And I think that's something really important to remember when you're going in to any career, but like Jilla, you do an amazing job at this, like bringing a lot of balance to your life. Oh, thank you. I, I try. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you clearly have other values and I think that that's, that brings so much more joy mm-hmm. and depth to the musical part of you and the or you know for me like the business entrepreneurship mm-hmm. part of music because I have other interests like I I love to be outside you know I love mm-hmm. to cook I love to give gifts and spend time in my community and give back and um you know, all these other things. And that makes me a good candidate for being in the entertainment industry, because I think if you are too buried, yeah, there, there's such a thing as being like too ambitious to where you are blinded at the ways that you're not taking care of yourself. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very true. And that's, I think in, in the entertainment industry in particular, it is so easy to fall victim to that and that happened to me when I moved to town and really dove head first in like I'm gonna be a music career woman and then I like looked up and it had been eight weeks since I had a day off oh my god <laughs> yeah and like I don't say that with pride like that's that's not a cool thing like it's not cool it's not fun it didn't it doesn't it doesn't make me any better than anybody else yeah and so at the end of your your career at the end of your life like if you have if you have nothing but that career which first of all unlikely because hello networking yes <laughs> like the best networking i've found is people that want to take hikes with me or that volunteer with me yeah, yeah. or you know, go to the park or whatever mm-hmm. or, you know so i think like when you ask my purpose my purpose in having this career is because i love music and there's nothing that i you know, can see myself doing that I enjoy more. Yeah. Um, and I love people and people are involved with music and that makes sense for me. And right. it just, it fits me. Right. I love it. But that's not my life's purpose. My life's purpose is a lot of different things. It's family, friends, community, giving back, mm-hmm. laughing, you know, culture, all these things. So I think that's important to remember when you're like, assessing your purpose <laughs> <laughs> that is beautiful that is that is really beautiful well thank you so much for sharing your purpose and all the other things <laughs> with us this has been really fun and we're gonna do we're gonna do many more podcasts together because there's just so much more I want to ask you <laughs> oh you're so sweet we'll do a part two all right <laughs> we'll do part two <laughs> all right thanks again thanks for having me Thanks for joining us today. You know, building your best life and career is about finding balance in everything you do. So build your life on purpose and you'll find success, happiness, and peace. And remember, whatever stage you're on today, walk with purpose.